Hey everybody, welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. If you are watching on YouTube, we are back in California at the studio we recorded in. We love it here. It's so awesome. So that's why we look a little bit different. Okay, we're going to jump into it. So our case sources this week are a 48 Hours episode and the Killer Speaks episode. And we will link those in our episode notes. Our episode begins on September 30th, 2005 in Pampa, Texas. It's 7:11 a.m. when a 911 call comes in from a very scared 10-year-old little girl. Sheriff's office, 911. Ma'am, uh-huh. there was a shootout in my house. Um, I don't know who's alive in my house, but I'm scared. Where are you at? Um, 7142 Highway 70. It's about 13.3 miles out from the bowling alley. What's your name? Robin Doan, my parents. Oh, um, Conrad and Brian Conrad. I'm scared of this and I don't know what Robin to do. Robin Doan? Yes, ma'am. Brian Conrad. My mom is alive. Okay, I'll stay on with you. I've got the ambulance and the fire department to come to it, okay? Thank you so much. You're coming. <laughs> So you can literally hear how scared 10-year-old Robin Doan is in the call. It's heartbreaking. She's so scared. Robin lived with her mother, Michelle Conrad, her stepfather, Ryan Conrad, and her older brother, Zach. They live on a farm. Um, Ryan was a farmer, and Robin actually had a dog named Molly. Okay, but now when I say a farm, you will see in the pictures, but this is in the middle of nowhere. It's literally just a house and then fields as far as you can see yeah okay so robin's mother michelle was six months pregnant at the time of the 911 call robin recalls being woke up by gunshots and the sound of her mother screaming keep in mind she's 10 years old she jumped out of her bed and crouched by her bedroom door to listen what was going on at this point all she could hear was someone stomping around the house after the gunshots scared robin jumped back into her bed completely frozen in terror the intruder she had heard then opened her bedroom bedroom door and fired two rounds at her. But as you could tell on the 911 call, she was alive. The bullets only grazed her left arm and left leg. But Robin played dead in her bed after hearing the shots. Okay. After the intruder shot at her, he opened the door to her brother Zach's room next door and Robin heard gunshots and moaning. Robin continued to play dead in her bed, scared to death. But two and a half hours later, she knew that she needed to get up and do something despite how scared she was. She decided to get out of the bed, go straight to the kitchen and grab the home phone and then go onto the porch and call 911. So she doesn't walk through the house. She just like beelines to the to the phone and then gets out of the house. Okay. When police arrived, they are so confused. Why had this specific house been chosen? Like I said, it's in the middle of nowhere. But they do know one thing. They don't think the killer, whoever it is, intended to leave a 10-year-old witness behind. When police pull up almost 20 minutes after she called 911, because they're in the middle of nowhere, Robin runs straight to an officer and jumps in his arms. For safety, Robin is locked in the back of a cop car as they don't know if the killer is still around or even still in the house. Police head into the crime scene and it's not good. A whole family with a pregnant mother basically slaughtered. What? They discover that the east door of the family house had been kicked in. Brian was shot three times. Michelle, the mom, was shot six times. And the brother, Zach, had also been shot three times in his sleep. And they even shot Molly, the poor puppy, twice. And remember, they shot at Robin, but she lived. And this is all by that intruder yes robin was sitting in the back of the car wondering if any of her family would walk out of the front door she didn't know if any of the family had somehow survived like her and so she sat there hoping robin asked trooper chad brooks if she could feed her animals on the farm while they searched the house instead of just sitting and waiting in the car so a sweet officer is tasked with walking around the farm with robin in hopes of taking her mind off of what was happening and you can actually see this in the video footage from the police cams it's really sweet i don't think there was anything else they could have done for her besides just let her go be with her animals and feed them after the feeding was over and reality slowly sinked back in Robin asked if any of her family had survived. The police tell her no. I'm surprised that she didn't flinch or anything. I mean, I know it was just a graze, but that would still hurt. It's insane. After time had passed and family was contacted, Robin went to her grandma's house. But 12 hours after the murders of her whole family, Robin was taken to a children's advocacy center called The Bridge to be professionally interviewed. I mean, she is the only witness to the crime. 
There is video footage of this and Robin says in the footage, it's so sad. She says she's tired of talking about this, but she is so brave and she's strong in her statements. She says that she isn't sure, but she believed that she saw a white face and then um, when the gunshots went off, she saw a flash. She says that she didn't hear anything besides the shots that morning and that it happened around 3 a.m. And also that she counted 15 shots. When police searched the house, they collected 15 rounds. Interesting. Like this 10-year-old had counted each shot and There's got it right. no way I could have done that. No, it's so sad. When Robin is done with the interview, she is taken to a safe house just for precaution. The whole community um, turned up for the family's funerals. But keep in mind, like, why was this whole family slaughtered? Everyone's nervous. Yeah. Robin hated the funeral, but police were watching and looking for suspicious activity, um, but no leads came of it. Around town, everyone is getting nervous when police are coming up pretty empty handed during the investigation. They had the shell casings, the blood evidence, shoe prints and tire tracks, but they didn't have any DNA and they didn't have any fingerprints. They ruled out burglary, so they really couldn't find a motive for why this whole family had been killed. And again, it's in the middle of nowhere, though. So yeah. there couldn't be too many suspects, correct? Well, and yeah, it's like, is this really random? In the middle of nowhere, this family targeted, it takes a while to get out to their house. Like, it makes you feel like, okay, this You'd had to be to someone that knew where they the live. family, right? Yeah. So police have no clue who could have done this, though. There's nothing that is leading them to anything. But one day before the murders in Pineville, Missouri, so now we're in a completely different state, a man named Matthew McCool received a call from someone trying to get a hold of his mother. This person had been trying all morning to get a hold of his mother um, and couldn't, and so now they were worried. Matthew hung up the phone, and he too tried to call his mom, but all of them went unanswered. So around lunchtime, he drove to his grandfather's house to check up on his mother. When he arrived at the house his grandpa shared with his mother, he found chaos. He discovered that his mother and grandfather had been murdered. Don McCool, Matthew's mother, who was very loving and caring, and his grandpa Orly McCool, who was also a very big part of Matthew's life, were both dead. Orly was on the floor in the house and Don was downstairs also on the floor. There were shell casings on the floor and they noticed that it wasn't your average ammo or shell casings. When a local policeman at the crime scene discovered this, they are reminded of a burglary report from the night before from a man named Scott King who lived just down the road. Okay. Scott reported that his son Levi had broke into his house while he was gone and stole some guns and ammo. And that specific ammo, the rare ammo, was some that was stolen that night that is now used in a double homicide down the street. Got it. The ammo used on Don and Orly was the same ammo that Levi King had stolen from his dad the night before just down the road. This is not a coincidence, and so police now have a suspect, 23-year-old Levi King. Law enforcement knew Levi because he had served time in prison for burglarizing a neighbor's house and then burning it down afterwards. Jeez. He was sentenced to 14 years for that crime, but served less than three years and had been sent to a halfway house after being released. He had then disappeared from that halfway house and was actually on the run just a week before Orly and Don were murdered. Just a week before he had broke into his father's house and stole guns and ammo. Police began the manhunt for Levi after members of the McCool family informed them that a pickup was missing. A Burgundy 2005 Dodge pickup was missing from Orly and Don's house. Police put a broadcast out for the truck and also enlist a nationwide warrant for Levi King. So what police think happened is Levi runaways from this halfway house, makes his way back to his dad's house, steals these guns, steals this ammo, walks down the street, breaks in and kills Orly and Don. And then steals their pickup truck and leaves. So they're like, okay. he's on the run. We have to find him. Back in Texas, in El Paso now, Levi King is actually found by Border Patrol after this like nationwide manhunt Man is hunt. basically going on. They found guns in the back of the truck and they detained him. He was questioned by El Paso police until Missouri police could arrive. And do you know why he was in El Paso? No. Because he was trying to cross the border to, get to, to get to Mexico. Okay. Yes. So I know. Yeah, so you know. <laughs> it took only 15 minutes for Levi to confess to killing Orly and Don back in Missouri. When police ask, why did you kill them? Levi says he doesn't know. He just broke in and did it and um, says that after he did it, it was a better feeling than doing any drugs he had ever done. 
What? Yeah. So Missouri police load Levi and the pickup and they drive back to Missouri. After a pretty fast open and shut case, it takes roughly two weeks for Levi to reach back out to police asking to talk to them. And they're like, why does he need to talk to us? This was open and shut. Like we caught him the next day. Case closed. Police head to where Levi is being held in prison and they ask him what's up. He says to them, you know, there's four more that I killed in Texas, right? Why, why, why would he tell them that? Because I don't know. He's crazy. Yeah. Levi had killed 10 year old Robin's whole family just a day after killing Orly and Don. For no, well, not for no reason because it quote unquote, it felt good. It felt good. So police initially didn't know what Levi was talking about. No one had reached out to them about more murders. Levi describes the area where he thinks he killed this random family and Missouri investigators reach out to Texas police. They ask him if they'd had any recent family homicides and it didn't take long for the departments to piece everything together. Levi King had convinced himself that killing would solve all of his bad feelings. He claims they did. Like, he felt better after killing. That's so just ironic. Yeah, but the feeling didn't last very long. Levi seems to have, like, a lack of connection with other humans. At age four, he had set his sister's room on fire after burning all of her prized possessions. Around 10 and 11, Levi started smoking and drinking and then started taking pills and drugs around 12. Levi claims that his anger came came from his bad childhood and he grew up in the backwoods in Missouri. There was no sewage at his house, no electricity, no running water. He claims that his father was violent and angry and pictures and videos of his childhood home are scary. Like I looked at them, there are guns and knives everywhere. It doesn't feel like a very good place for children to be being raised. Okay. Obviously, Levi had a rough childhood, but so did his sisters and brothers, and they didn't go on and kill people. Levi grew up killing animals and pets. He says that his father encouraged him to kill animals and pets, and at age 20, he burglarized and set fire to that neighbor's house, which landed him in prison. So he kind of had a lot of signs of... What yes. Is ser- who, ser- a serial killer, Yes, like correct? He, Yes. There was those obvious signs that we see. Okay. After fleeing the halfway house, now a fugitive, Levi hitchhiked back to his family home in Pineville, Missouri. Once he got home, he was not welcomed warm by his dad. So he got in an argument with him and his dad says, you're not welcome here. You need to leave. And this set Levi off, according to him. On the morning of September 29th, 2005, at nine o'clock, he snuck into his family home after his dad goes to work. He vandalizes the house, like literally just rips things off the wall, destroys furniture, and then steals an AK-47, a hunting rifle, and a nine millimeter handgun and leaves. A couple miles down the road, he watches as Orly and Dawn leave their house in their pickup truck. Levi sees this as an empty house and breaks in. He's raging at this point. He looks for keys to any car, but he can't find anything. And for some reason, he decides not to leave. He decides to sit and wait. When Dawn and Orly pulled back into the driveway that day, Levi moved to the front door and waited. He knew what he was going to do before they had even walked in the house. Dawn and then Orly entered the house and Dawn walks immediately down to the living room. When Orly stepped in, Levi charged him. He opened fired on Orly and Orly drops to the ground. Dawn hears the shots and freezes at the bottom of the stairs. Her grocery bags are still in her hand. Levi turned and immediately fired at Dawn as well, hitting her in the leg. He continued to shoot until Dawn wasn't moving anymore. He then grabbed the keys to the pickup truck and heads outside. He sits in the pickup truck thinking about what just happened. And he says this is his like euphoria moment. He describes it as the most peace he's ever felt in his life, the highest high he's ever felt, and that nothing else in the world mattered. That is so evil. So Dr. Lewis Lessinger, who is like a psychologist, says that any killer who is harboring anger and self-loathing, this release of emotion like comes when killing and it does feel good. Got it's it. not an excuse. He's just explaining the why Levi's saying he felt this. Levi explains this murder as misplaced rage that he hated his father and that's why he did this. Um, but Dr. Lewis says, no, Levi has always wanted to kill. He has thought about killing and it didn't matter who it was. He was going to end up killing at some point. Okay. So after Levi killed Orly and Dawn, he started driving in their truck. He just got on the highway, started driving. 
this high that he had had lasted for hours while he was driving west through Oklahoma. Around 3.48 a.m., after driving more than 30 hours straight, Levi was in Texas at this point, and he pulled over to try and sleep. He says that he couldn't sleep, and so he started driving again, and the high from killing Orly and Dawn had completely worn off at this point. All he says he could think about was the feeling, like wanting to feel that again, wanting to get that high again. And it was this thought that crossed his mind as he was driving down a back road and past Robin's family's farm. Psychologically, this one is just super interesting. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or absolutely horrible, but it's just like there's so much to dissect about it. His brain was was thinking what it was thinking. Yeah, totally. Or he was thinking what he was thinking. So Levi says he immediately knew what he was going to do and what he wanted to do. He was now entering a killing spree. So this is what this is what all the doctors are describing is that this rampage, okay. this high, this is a killing spree. This is what killers who do this, they're just chasing that high and then that leads them on a killing spree. And Got Levi it. has now entered this. Levi turned the car around and drove back to the family farm he had passed. And he says, oh, I didn't know I was going to kill. I just passed the farm and then decided to do it. And Dr. Lewis says, that's not true. This wasn't random. Levi had somehow made his way to the back roads, middle of nowhere in Texas. And he says he did this because he was subconsciously looking for a house for For victims to kill. So that he's like, even if he wasn't like, oh, I drove all the way out there to kill someone. He says he got off the highway and started driving out into the middle of nowhere for a reason. Levi, you know, once he got to the house, walked up to the back door and kicked it in. He noticed a bedroom off to the left. And when he opened the door, he saw Brian and Michelle sleeping. Michelle woke up first and Levi fired several rounds into her, waking up Brian, who he then turned to and did the same. Levi says he then made his way to 10-year-old Robin's room and fired the two shots at her. Like he literally opened it up, saw it was a child and still proceeded to shoot at her. I don't understand what, and I know there's so much to it, but what's getting this high because he's just opening the door, firing the shots and and leaving. leaving. Like she lived. Yes. So like he doesn't even know if they're dead. It's just the thought of death. I don't know. It's it's insane. I don't think we can fathom it. I don't think we can. After shooting the two shots at her, he then went into a sleeping Zach's room and shot him while he was in his sleep. So I don't know why he only stood in the doorway shooting at her, but then like walked all the way into Zach's room and shot at him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. it's just it's weird. This whole thing is strange. Yeah. Levi then goes to the living room and says that he just walked around the living room looking at the pictures, looking at the family's stuff, thinking about that he had just killed this whole family. Like then proceeded to try to figure out who they were after killing them. What a psychopath. And keep in mind, this whole time, Robin is in her room faking dead. Like hearing him walk around. And every time she peeks out to try to look at the door, she says that she could see a figure standing by her door and so it scared her. But then later she realized it was just her robe hanging oh, on her wow. door. So this whole time she's faking dead. She's too scared because she thinks he's still standing there. But then once she like actually got up, she realized it was just her robe, which is like what nightmares are made of, right? Yeah. I mean, don't we all do that? Don't we all like make little figures of things in the room at night? But she probably would have left her room if it wasn't for her robe. Exactly. Yeah. She was so scared that he was still standing there. That's and crazy. And it might have saved her life. Wow. Robin can obviously hear Levi rubbaging through the cupboards and the drawers in the living room, but she said it eventually stopped. And Levi feels like although the first murders gave him a high, he said these ones didn't. He didn't feel anything after he killed them. Um, And Dr. Lewis says that his emotions didn't actually have time to like get all the way to a peak again. And so this makes sense why he didn't feel the high. He didn't wait long enough in between the murders to like go through the whole cycle once again. This is this is insane. Insane. So 29 hours after killing his first victims, Levi crosses the border into Mexico. But then he pulls off to get gas or food or something and then claims when he got back on, he got back on the wrong way. And so he ended up driving like right back up into the border and got stuck at the border and couldn't turn back around. So he was going to have to go back through the border. Got it. And this is where 
Cops look at him, recognize him, see the guns, and arrest him. Oh, so he he was he had actually he made it into Mexico. Oh wow! But he got turned around and drove back, and then got caught. That's called karma at its finest, yes. right there. So back in Missouri, Levi King pleads guilty to the murder of Orly and Don McCool. In Texas, the state actually wants to try him for the death penalty. So after that case is done, they're like, well bring him back to texas and we're going to try him for slaughtering a whole entire family and yeah. leaving a 10 year old without any family horrible it's four years later when texas state finally takes levi king to sentencing and 10 year old robin who is now 14 testified at trial in front of the man who killed her whole family which imagine how scary that is the jury sentences him to life in prison without the possibility of parole Levi King was interviewed from prison for the Killer Speaks TV show, and he says he feels no remorse or guilt about what he did. Oh, my gosh. He says even during trial, he really didn't feel bad, and he still doesn't. He's like a zombie. Yeah. Robin Doan told Levi in court that she forgave him so that she could heal. She doesn't want to be defined by what happened when she can live her life to the fullest. So she hopes that this story gives hope to everyone um, to know that there is always a brighter tomorrow that she went through this and she is trying to make her tomorrows better than the day before. So how old is she now? So I think she's probably around 26, that's 27. It's a, that's crazy. It's like my age. Yeah, it's insane. Oh my gosh. And she's the only person left from her family. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. Brian and Michelle Conrad were loving parents. They leave that legacy with Robin. Her brother, Zach, was an innocent victim. And Robin actually feels peace in the fact that he didn't wake up, that he was shot in his sleep because she means she knows he didn't feel pain. Yeah. But she says, like, he was still cheated a life. Like, he was cheated out of life because of Levi King. Orly and Don McCool left behind a family who loves them. They were chosen at random, like all of the victims in this story, but they impacted people's lives for the best. And so we will take this moment to remember the victims alive and dead from this story. So let us remember them for who they were and who they are. Okay, you guys, that is the story of Levi King and the rampage he went on back in 2005. I was going to say that it was such a black and white case. Right? Like it was, it was pretty open and shut. I mean... Yeah. Uh, not so much for the McCool family because it did take a while yes. to, I mean, even though they were found first, it did take a while to be connect the, connect dots. the dots. But once it was connected, I mean, he had like completely confessed. Yeah, so there was no lying. He was just like, I did it. At least that closure for this case was faster than some of the cases yep. we've seen. So I do just want to give a reminder about our merch. Thank you so, so much for supporting us and love us. Seriously, we feel it. We see all of your messages. We see all of your comments. Peyton reads every single message. Yeah, I really do try. So I'm... I, I do too. Yeah. <laughs> I do read most of them to him because most of the time he's sitting next to me while yeah. I'm doing it. Um, but we do just want to say thank you for your support. Thank you for your love. And we will see you guys next week with another episode. I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye.